morning all you beautiful humans out there on YouTube. Paul Fadika here with my self-improvement channel and today I want to talk about a business leader that is super inspirational. He's actually the wealthiest man in the world right now as of 2018 and his name is Jeff Bezos. But first I gotta check out of this hotel before room service kicks me out. Let's get going. And some Starbucks caffeine for the road. Whew, that's good. <laughs> That'll get you going for the day. All right, let's be on our way. Jeff Bezos is the wealthiest man in the world right now. As of 2018, his net worth is $130 billion, which just blows my mind. And he made his fortune founding Amazon.com. He founded it back in 1994, 24 years ago. And I've been reading a biography about him, trying to figure out how did the guy get so successful? What made him such a great guy? What sort of lessons can I learn from his life? that made him so successful. And that's gonna be the topic of today's video. Okay, we're gonna start off by rewinding back to 1993. At this point, Jeff is 31 years old. He graduated college with a computer science major. He got married. He got a very lucrative job making about $130,000 a year on Wall Street at a hedge fund called D.E. Shaw. So at this point in his life, he's smart, He's living in New York City. He's got a comfortable, high-paying, high-position job. He's doing really well for himself. Now, this is 1993, so the internet is just starting to get developed. So Jeff and his boss, D.E. Shaw, that the hedge fund is named after, have a brainstorming session where they come up with a bunch of internet company ideas. One of the internet company ideas was a company kind of like Yahoo Mail. The next one was a stock trading company like E-Trade. But the most interesting company to Jeff Bezos that they came up with was called the Everything Store. It would be an online retail store you could order anything and everything from. And looking back at it now, now that's probably the least inspiring business idea to come out of the dot-com era because when you think about it, all they're really doing is replacing a mail order business that uses catalogs with a website. Anyway, that brings me to the first lesson that I want to talk about, which is keeping an eye out for opportunities and getting in early. Don't focus on where the ball has been, focus on where it's going. Now that's a lot easier said than done, because you don't know what the next big thing, you don't know what the next big trend, the next big phase is going to be. What impressed Jeff and Shaw about the internet wasn't its size or its scope, it was the growth rate. Which if you look back on it, it's just this crazy exponential curve straight up of people using it, bytes being sent over the internet. So when you're looking for opportunities, look for small things with big growth rates. Because small things with big growth rates are going to be big before you know it. And Jeff could have stayed at his comfy job on Wall Street and worked on building this everything store company within D.E. Shaw. And D.E. Shaw ended up building a couple internet companies of their own, which they later spun off on an IPO or got acquired, making Shaw a billionaire himself. But Jeff knew that if he started the everything store company, within D.E. Shaw. He would never fully own it. He would never be his own boss. It'd be D.E. Shaw that would own most of it. He would have to leave his comfort in New York on Wall Street and set out on his own if he wanted to be his own boss. And that brings us to our second lesson, which is that whenever you create something, own as much of it as you can. Even today, Jeff Bezos still owns 17% of Amazon.com, which is just crazy to me considering he's raised literally billions of dollars. He still managed to hold on to 17% of his company, which is why he has such a mind-blowing $130 billion net worth right now. If he stayed within D.E. Shaw, he wouldn't have the control and the ownership that he has today. So Jeff tells his boss Shaw that he's leaving to start his own company. So Shaw takes him for a walk to try to change his mind. He tells him, first of all, they're likely going to end up competing. Second of all, Jeff is walking away from a big Wall Street bonus right in the middle of the year. And third, Jeff has a lot to lose on this personally. 
because according to Jeff himself, the company had a 70% chance of failing and losing all the money him and all his family invested in it. Now at the time, Jeff had just finished a biography about a British butler who was reflecting back on the important junctures in life, all the important decisions that he made, and that made Jeff think. Fast forward 50 years into the future when Jeff is 80 years old and look back at all the things that he accomplished. What are the decisions that he is going to regret the least? Jeff calls this his regret minimization framework, which is simply a way of saying that the decisions you make today should be the decisions that you will probably regret the least at the end of your life. So imagine if Jeff had decided to stay at his job as he was sitting there watching this internet thing just take off like it would do in the dot-com bubble. He would be kicking himself like, dude, I should have at least been a part of this. What was I thinking? Now, on the other hand, imagine if he did try with this internet startup company and it ended up being a total flop, lost him all his money. He wouldn't regret having at least tried. Psychological research shows that people regret missing opportunities more than they regret having tried and failed. And from that point of view, the choice was obvious for Jeff. He was gonna go for it. A funny part in the biography at this point was, Jeff is on the phone with his mom, telling her about how he's gonna leave his high-paying Wall Street job to go start up a company to sell books online. She's on the phone with him like, don't do it, Jeff. You should just stay at your job, work on the business on the weekends or after hours. He said, no, mom, things are moving fast. I gotta jump on it. And that brings me to my third lesson, which is don't get comfortable. The opposite of success isn't failure, it's comfort. Comfortable people are complacent. They don't see any reason to change. They don't see any reason to do anything different, to learn, to grow, to change, to improve, to better themselves. They're happy with where they are right now, so they're fine with just repeating the same patterns and routines over and over again. They like where they're at, so they don't want to go anywhere. And don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with being comfortable and happy and content with your life, but you're not gonna achieve great things by being comfortable. And I don't know about you guys, but I think I need a change of scenery. Let's get out of here. Okay, we got 47 minutes to film this. Let's get going. What's up guys, I'm back again. It's already starting to rain a little bit, so we're gonna have to make this quick. Otherwise, I'm gonna get rained out here. So, mail order companies avoid being located in populous states like California and New York because then they have to pay a state income tax on the purchases if they have a physical location. So rather than staying in New York City or going to Silicon Valley, California, he decided he was gonna move to Seattle, Washington because it was located near a large book distribution warehouse. And Jeff Bezos, he just up and moved immediately, driving 45 hours from New York City to Seattle. Sitting in the passenger seat of a car, writing out his business plans and projecting revenues in an Excel spreadsheet. I mean, that's some dedication right there. And then to finance his startup, he put down $94,000 of his own money and $100,000 that he borrowed from his parents. Now that's dedication. And that brings us to our fourth lesson, which is being dedicated when you decide to do something. I'm, I, I decided to do this YouTube channel, and now here I am sitting on a dock, getting rained on, but I don't care, because I'm seeing this channel through. When you start a project, you have to be fully committed and go all in on it. You don't want to be going half and half, having one foot in and one foot out. You don't want to hedge your bets. You want to try to take this thing as far as it can go. Now, Jeff couldn't just start out selling everything under the sun, literally. He had to pick a category that would work for a mail order business. It had to be a commodity, and it had to be something that was easy to ship. And the category he picked was books. He ended up naming the company Amazon.com along with the slogan, Earth's Largest Bookstore, which ended up getting them sued by Barnes & Noble later on. And Amazon just totally dominated this market. Today, in 2018, Amazon accounts for 
two-thirds of all online book sales. But Amazon has expanded far beyond just selling books. Book sales only account for 7% of their billions of dollars in revenue. But we're going to get to that point later. And the reason why they were able to dominate is because Amazon was able to deliver a much better book buying experience than traditional retail stores could do. The retail stores have a limited amount of shelf space, so they can only stock maybe 10,000 books in a store at any given time. But there are over 3 million books in print. So what if you want to get one of those 3 million books and it's not a bestseller, you're not going to find it on the shelves of Barnes & Noble. Where do you go? Amazon.com solved that problem by providing a huge online bookstore for you to order anything you wanted. They were tapping into what's called the long tail. Now, the long tail is all those millions of items that aren't bestsellers, aren't greatest hits, but they have a niche following that some people want to still read. Netflix would later capitalize on this exact same long tail in order to start their DVD rental business and beat the crap out of Blockbuster. Now imagine if Amazon had picked something stupid to start with, like let's say dog food, like Pets.com did. It's hard to ship and ordering dog food online provides no more value than it is purchasing it in a store. And that long tail is Amazon's first out of four advantages we're going to cover that Amazon had over its competitors at the time. The second advantage Amazon had was genuine user reviews, where users could leave positive or negative feedback on whatever book they had purchased, which pissed off a lot of publishers because the books that they were trying to sell were getting dumped on with negative reviews because they sucked. Now, this pissed off some people in the publishing industry. One CEO called Jeff and told them, your job was to sell books, not to trash them with negative reviews. To which Jeff responded saying, Amazon makes money when it helps the customer find what they want, not when it sells books which shows his customer focus above all else. In retail stores, even today, there aren't any user reviews you can read. The third advantage Amazon had over retail stores was personalization. Amazon can figure out what books are similar to what and give customers recommendations of what they should buy and read next. Books and titles they might have never heard of otherwise. They can do this because they have the purchase history of millions of users. They know what they like, they know what is similar and what sells. The fourth and final advantage Amazon had over traditional retail stores that we're going to cover today was affiliate marketing. Now affiliate marketing is where when you refer business to Amazon and that customer ends up making a purchase, you can take 7% of the cut, which encourages people all over the internet to basically advertise Amazon for themselves, which means Amazon didn't have to waste millions of dollars on TV ads and print ads trying to get the word out in a very inorganic kind of way. It harnessed the social network that was already on the internet to drive sales. Which brings us to our fifth lesson, which is know what your strengths are, know what your advantages are, and stick to them. A lot of early investors in Amazon were encouraging Jeff to branch out and get new product categories, but he resisted for four years just sticking with books until he nailed the business model before he expanded into other commodities. You don't have to do everything for everyone. You just have to do one thing well and stick to it. What's ironic when I say this is that Jeff himself took a long time to learn this lesson. Instead of sticking with his core competencies, during the dot-com mania, he borrowed billions of dollars and then blew it all on stupid dot-com startup ideas, on buying other hyped-up dot-com companies that ended up going nowhere. Amazon had all these crazy business expansion ideas that ended up just wasting billions of dollars and putting the company in deep financial trouble by 2001. But that's a story for another video. Had Jeff just stuck to his core competencies, Amazon wouldn't have been in as much trouble as it was. Now from 1994 to 2000, Jeff grew Amazon.com from nothing to over a billion dollars in revenue per year. And that's an amazing feat. But despite it all, he had his haters, he had his doubters, he had his critics. There was the CEO of Starbucks who approached Jeff and told him that without a physical retail space, he wouldn't ever get anywhere and that he needed to partner with Starbucks in order to sell Amazon items in Starbucks stores. Otherwise, Amazon was doomed. To which Jeff said, I'm taking this company to the moon. Then he was attacked by the CEOs of Barnes & Noble, Walmart, who said they were going to start their own online retail companies and absolutely crush him, which obviously did not happen because Amazon is still dominating online retail. Then there were Wall Street analysts saying Amazon was gonna run out of cash. Internet shopping was just a fad. Consumers were gonna get over it. And in the end, Jeff managed to prove them all wrong. And that brings me to my sixth and final lesson. Because we're running out of time here and my battery's gonna die, 
which is whenever you do something worthwhile, you're going to get haters and critics who are going to tell you you can't do it. Don't let that get to you. you have competitors who are going to try to crush you. You just got to fight back harder. Whew, my foot's getting sore. I've been sitting here too long. Ugh. Ugh. Gotta stretch it out. Okay. I think I'm going to be fine. So to recap, those six lessons were look for high growth opportunities. Own whatever you create. Own as much of it as you can. Don't get comfortable with where you're at. Be fully committed to whatever you decide to do and see it all the way through. Figure out what your strengths and advantages are and stick to just those. And sixth and finally, know that you will have haters and competitors and people who will try to mess with you. But don't let that stop you. I suppose we could have just skipped to the ending and said that all really quick in a fast paragraph worth of bullet points, but I don't think that would have been nearly as interesting or as informative. <laughs> anyway guys, I gotta get headed out of here. Ugh. I wanna say thanks to all you guys out there on YouTube for watching this video. I hope it was helpful and kind of entertaining at the same time. Drop a comment telling me how much money have you wasted so far on your life on buying stuff on Amazon.com. <laughs> anyway, I'll see you guys again soon. Peace out. Would you look at that? Still got three minutes left on the clock to go. <laughs>